Um, there's kind of three subjects <clears throat> today. One is uh, test-driven development in general. Uh, the the other is um, PHP spec, uh, and the sort of added bonus is the cool stuff that PHP Storm have done recently to to make it easier to use PHP spec. <clears throat> so I'll talk a little bit about BDD, TDD, where PHP spec lives, and there'll be some some live demos. Let's get get on to it. If you um, if you start reading the documentation of PHP spec or come to some talks, you'll see that it's referred to as a BDD tool. Uh, and that can be confusing, so I want to address that first. Um, is BDD the same as TDD? And the, uh, the, the spoiler alert, the answer is sort of. <laughs> so there's a definition of BDD that Dan North came up with. It's a second generation, outside in, pool based, multiple stakeholder, multiple scale, high automation, agile methodology. And as you can see, that doesn't really fit on a slide, and it's quite complicated explanation. Liz Keogh has a, a, a sort of more concise definition which is BDD is when you use examples in a conversation to illustrate behavior, the behavior of the system you're designing. So that's it simply. It's, it's driven by the behavior. You start by saying what the system's supposed to do and you use that to drive your development, drive your development workflow which is a very similar concept to TDD. So let's go back a little bit. Um, <clears throat> classical TDD, as defined by people like Kent Beck, is, is a simple cycle for developers. Um, it's a simple workflow for developers. Before you start writing your code, you write a test. Um, and the test is gonna tell us whether we wrote the right code. So we start up here at the top uh, in a red state. We deliberately write a test that we know is going to fail. Then we write some code. So the tests go from green to red, sorry, red to green. And then once the tests are green, we do this thing called refactoring. Refactoring is taking working software and making it better. And once you finish refactoring, you write another test that's going to cause it to fail. So we kind of kind of dip into this red failing state for a short time. We get out of that failing state by writing some code that passes the test. And then we spend most of our time down at the bottom here with passing tests uh, and, we're, and we're refactoring, we're making the code better. So the problem with this <clears throat> One of the only problems with this, because it does work really well, is this word here, test. You start by say, saying to new people, you know, the first thing you need to do is write a test. And that sounds counterintuitive. That doesn't sound like um, how people normally think about the word test. A test, you know, think about normal language. A test is something that happens afterwards. So Dan North um, noticed this, and he, he renamed it. He, he <clears throat> did this initially in a framework called jbehave, and also he was involved in coaching and, and teaching people to do TDD. So he said, well, why don't we change the terminology slightly? Before you write the code, you're going to describe how the system's going to behave. So that's the same thing as writing a test. <laughs> but you're going to think of it more like a description. And then when you're coding, you're implementing that specification. And when you're refactoring, you're improving on, on your design. So it's the same thing, but we're using different words. And that really kind of affects how, how, you, how you apply this stuff. <clears throat> One of the main changes that has, has happened since behavior-driven development, um, before since this terminology started to, to be used, is people are starting to see lots of other places in their workflow where this cycle applies. For instance, a user story is a description. A user story with acceptance criteria is a description of how the system should behave. Then we implement it and then we improve it. Um, a project goal is a description of how a project should succeed. And then we do the project. So in BDD, so, uh, conferences, etc. inside the community, you'll see a lot of talks about 
goal setting metrics, etc. So that's BDD. To show where PHP spec as a tool sits inside the PHP ecosystem, let's map out a few different tools. So the horizontal axis here is from tools that are more about testing to tools that are more about being descriptive and thinking about these things in BDD terms as specifications. And the other axis is, are we testing individual objects or are we testing the whole system? And the tool that um, most people are familiar with is PHP unit. I've since found out this is not an official logo of PHP unit. Um, but if you Google PHP unit, this is the only result that comes up on Google Images. Um, <clears throat> so the PHP unit is focused around testing, um, which isn't a bad thing. Uh, and also you can use PHP unit at every different scale. So you can use PHP unit to write unit tests and test objects one at a time, or you can use PHP unit to exercise your entire system by driving something like Selenium. It's, it's a tool that can be used for all these different things. Another tool I'm sort of involved with is BHAT. BHAT is very much a BDD tool. And BHAT is really only used um, to drive either your whole system or at, at the, the lowest scale where BHAT's applicable really is driving the application layer. Um, driving sets of objects, trying to achieve business tasks. The reason for that is BHAT's based on business requirements and it's unusual for you to have one object that can fulfill a real business requirement. If you have, it's probably a really big object and you should break it up. So there's a little gap here. This is where PHP spec slots in. It's a tool that's aimed at a BDD workflow. It's a tool that's aimed at people who are going to actually do TDD. It's not aimed at people who are going to write their tests afterwards. And it makes an assumption. The assumption is that you're going to, 99% of the time, be using this tool to test an individual class. There's a strength in that because it can be more specialized. PHP unit has to uh, address all the different types of testing you might want to do. PHP spec is just focused on unit testing. So this gives us a few gains in terms of um, a nice descriptive syntax. We can assume that you're just going to be right, right, testing one class at a time, take some of the boilerplate out of the tests. I will say, if you aren't doing any kind of testing at the moment and you want to learn a new tool, PHP unit is not a bad place to start because it's useful for all the different types of testing. If you just want to get into unit testing to start off with, use PHP spec, it's really good. <laughs> It'll encourage good practice. So it's all about writing descriptions of individual classes. It was inspired by a tool called RSpec, um, and if you want to know about behavior-driven development, the RSpec book is really good. It covers not only RSpec, but Cucumber, which is like BHAP. Uh, and you can kind of squint a bit and ignore all the Ruby examples, and, and there's a lot of good discussion about testing in there. So Padraig and Travis started this project, never really got to 1.0, but it got a bit of traction. Um, those two do tons and tons of open source projects, so it's not surprising they, they can't dedicate their time to this. It eventually got taken over by uh, my friend Marcelo. Uh, and he, he took it to a 1.0 release, um, made it really usable. This is kind of when I started to become aware of PHP spec. Then a complete rewrite happened. So Marcelo and Constantine, Constantine who is behind BHAT, were using PHP spec and thought, let's make it better. They started with a new repository, wrote it up um, from the ground upwards, and PHP spec 2 was the kind of start of the current project, if that makes sense. I started using this tool when it was, um, we were just using DevMaster, to be honest, um, from this version of PHP spec, and I really liked it. Um, 
I started working with Marcelo and Constantine. We were using this tool on projects successfully. It was very stable, but there was a big backlog of open issues. There was a bunch of features that we wanted to implement uh, and we haven't had a stable release. So I got involved in the project, started closing bugs, added quite a few new features, uh, and eventually took over. So what are the principles behind the project? Um, it's not a testing tool. We want to make it as, make the tests as readable as possible. So we want to, if we have to make a design decision, we're gonna go on the side of something that's got a nicer syntax. We want to encourage good design. What that means for a testing tool is we don't want to make it easy to test bad designs. So there are some features that we're deliberately not building in because it's just going to make you write bad objects. It's because we're assuming you're writing the test first. We don't, if we make it hard to test bad design, you'll only be able to do good design. This means it can be frustrating if you're applying it to a legacy project. But if you're writing new classes in a legacy project, it's going to be a good tool. We want to encourage the TDD cycle. So we're going to try and brainwash you by having lots of convenient features, lots of cool stuff. But if you're doing this workflow that you'll see when we do a demo, um, everything becomes easier. We want it to be easier to do TDD than not do TDD. And the first version of PHP spec suffered a bit by being quite strongly inspired by R spec. And so there were quite a few Rubyisms in the way that you express a test. This version, we try and use PHP conventions and make, use things that are familiar to PHP developers. So I got involved um, before we tagged the 2.0 release. I became lead maintainer. Um, we've had quite a few my releases on the 2.0 branch. It's, it's very stable nowadays, but it really is a community project. Um, I mean, it's not one of those projects where it's just me cranking out code. There's a huge list of contributors. I, I just snapshotted the, the highest ones at the, at the time. Uh, Stoff specifically, Christoph, um, does a huge amount of work reviewing um, every pull request that comes in very thoroughly, and uh, which he does for loads of projects. He's pretty amazing. You, of course, install it um, through Composer. We're actually at a version 3 release now um, and version 4 is planned for uh, the middle of this year which is going to drop support for PHP 5 but version 3 is going to be sticking around for people who are still on PHP 5 and this is a, all the configuration you need if this is as simple as your composer and install is your composer file is you don't need any extra config for PHP spec if you've got a more complex auto-loading scheme, you'll need to tell PHP spec a bit about it in a separate YAML file. <coughs> so we start with a requirement. Uh, the sales team have decided that if the home page says hello to our customers, um, they, we're going to get better conversions <laughs> on our shopping baskets, something like that. So we're going to do hello world. We need a component that greets people. So we start, of course, by describing the object. In TDD, we call this writing a test, but we're going to describe the object. We're going to make a specification. And the specification is going to contain a bunch of examples of how the object behaves. And the command is php spec describe. So this is the scary part. Live demo time. Oh, that worked. Um, Okay, so this is PHP Storm. I don't have a very complicated setup. Uh, you can see I've got a project here on the left, very basic composer JSON, <coughs> and I've, I've pre-run the composer install. But apart from that, there's nothing in my source folder. Uh, and I spend a lot of time in this terminal window. So the first thing I'm going to do is describe the object. So I run PHP spec. Describe, lose the ability to type when it's a live demo. And what you find is you make a lot of design decisions during this phase. So I just had to decide what to call it. 
I'm going to call it a greeter. I can change that later, but it's worth stopping and thinking, is that a good name? And PHP set generates a specification. What does that mean? It means it's created a folder called spec. It's made a specification, which is a PHP class. And there's no behavior in there yet. The only behavior is that it's an object, <laughs> my locale set to English. Um, <clears throat> it's an object that exists is the only behavior. So think, you can think of this as a spec, you can think of it as a failing test. Because, um, because this tool is optimized just for testing individual classes, you don't have to tell PHP spec which class you're testing, it's derived from the name of the spec. So for these demos, I'm not going to use a namespace. I could have put a namespace in here. Um, the, the structure of your spec folder just mirrors the structure of your source folder. And um, quite nicely, PHP Storm is aware of this. So the next thing is to check the object work, check the spec reflects reality. That's what testing is. We've got a description. We want to test that the real code um, fits the spec. And the fact they both live in the code base is going to be really good. So to verify this specification, what I do is PHP spec run. So I'm just asking, tell me if the specification matches reality. And I get this nice purple error message. So purple means broken. Um, not only did it's not it's, sorry, it's not reflecting a logic error. It's saying I can't run this thing you want me to run. So there's one specification called it is initializable here. It's failed because the class burrito doesn't exist, which actually PHP Storm is also highlighting. So we've got one spec, one example, one of which was broken. So 100% of the specs were were wrong. Because we want to make life easy for you, it's, there's only one way to solve classes not existing. So PHP specs nice and says, do you want me to create the greeter for you? So I can hit enter. A class called greeter has been created. And then the tests get executed again, automatically. This time around, one example, it's initializable, ran and it passed. I never look in my source folder. I have a, a class. <coughs> Don't worry about the final keyword. I have a custom template for that. Um, you can template these, these auto-generated things to match your preferences. So far, so simple. I haven't had to write any code yet. All I've written is uh, specifications. So now we add some behavior to the greeter. So when it greets you, it should return hello. That's a very simple example. It's an example because it's got a real string in and that kind of thing. I'm switching around too much. So how do we express this example? I'm going to start again by writing a test. Hmm. It. Uh, can greet. Okay, so like I said before, when you're writing specifications, this is where you do a lot of the design. It can greet. What does greeting look like? Um, so when I call greet, my typing really goes to pop. When I call greet, it should. Uh, thanks for the autocomplete. Hello. <coughs> so the only oddity there is if you're used to PHP unit, for instance, I don't have to instantiate the object because this is just for testing one object at a time. PHP spec is going to pick that up. And I call methods on the object just by calling them on this. So in the context of a spec, 
where you sort of pretend that this means the object I'm testing. So this thing I'm talking about, greet should return hello. It's meant to be like a sentence. So let's run it and see if it's true. It's not true. The first example passed. Second example was broken. And it's broken because there's no method called greet. Again, you can see PHP storms picking it up. Um, there's only one way to solve a method not existing. You offer to make it. So PHP specs offer to create greet. You'll see, I'll just open that briefly. It's popped in a method for me. And this time, this is the first time it's failed in a red state. Red means actually failed. This means everything executed okay, but something I asserted in the spec didn't match reality. So I said that Greek should return hello, and it didn't, it returned null. If you look at the class, you can see why. <coughs> so maybe now I'm allowed to write some code. Um, I actually don't have to yet. I can I can do this. I can run and say fake the output for me. So this only supports a limited set of cases, but uh, and it's hidden behind a flag. You have to pass this command or you have to have a config file turning this feature on. But this time it says it you said it would return hello, but it returned null. Do you want me to make it return hello? I say yes, and suddenly the tests are passing. So the PHP spec's written the code for me in that case. <clears throat> That's currently implemented just for return values, but we're, we're on the lookout for other places where, as we work with this tool, we're looking for places where we're doing repetitive tasks. So that act of going in and just adding return a hard-coded value, I do that a lot, so we've got a flag We've got a feature that does that for you. So that's the TDD cycle. Every time I've written a failing test, and every time it's failed, and then I've done something to make it pass. In most of the cases so far, PHP spec's done that for me. I have a question, uh, Kieran, if that's okay. Sure. Um, does the does the uh, fake switch work with um, all different types, you know, so, uh, so ints and booleans, or does it just work with a string? It's currently only um, scalar types that aren't arrays. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, we're probably going to add it for arrays, but we'll have to loop over the array and check that everything's a, a sort of simple value. And there's probably some objects we could do it for. Um, if someone wants to send a pull request for that, that'd be awesome. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, Thank you, Kieran. It works for integers, strings. Um, yeah, the, the other types I can't think of, floats, you know, all that stuff. So we saw that thing should return. We call that a matcher. <clears throat> it fills the same sort of space as an assertion in PHP unit. So a matcher is a method that, that starts with should. There's a bunch of built-in ones. So should return and should equal are um, synonyms. And you use matches, you can see, by just calling the method with some arguments, and then you say what should happen. So the sum of three and three should equal six. I'm being specific, you know, three plus three, six. That's what makes it an example. Uh, if, if I'm describing the behavior of that sum, I'd say, well, it adds the two numbers together. Can you give me an example? Yeah, three and three is six. You can assert things about types. Uh, there are some fuzzy matches. Um, you shouldn't have to use them very often. But down at the bottom, we've got get slug should match. That's going to run a regular expression against the string. Get name should contain. That's going to check that the array that's returned contains that value. There's some more complicated ones. If you use something like should be admin, will on an object, we'll see does that object have is admin. And if so, does it return true? Uh, has has logged in user maps to should have logged in user. So anything that starts with should have, we'll look for a has method. And there's a bunch more matches. Someone just added in the, the last release should iterate as. So that's useful. If you're saying 
So this is going to return something that I can loop over. You can sort of describe what values will appear when that thing's looped over. And you can make your own matches. So here's an example where <coughs> um, get response data should have JSON key, and then in the spec, I can define what having a JSON key looks like. All of these matches have negatives. We just put not in. So should not have uh, will also work. It's just the opposite. Haven't got it in the slides, but you can also uh, make an object that defines a matcher and point PHP spec to that and have a custom matcher available inside every spec. So um, that's all you need for testing a really trivial object, but objects get interesting when they start to talk to each other. That's what OO design's all about, right? <clears throat> so most of the time we're interested in talking about how objects communicate. So let's artificially introduce another concept. Um, so far it says hello, but when it greets a person called Bob, it should return hello, Bob. That's an example, because I've put Bob in there. <laughs> it's pretty unambiguous. So how do we express that in a spec? There are two objects here, the person and the greeter that we already have. So what's the interaction between them going to be? The greet is going to ask the person for their name. And that relationship is a query. I'm going to say, hey, give me, give me some data. PHP Stack integrates with a library called Prophecy to provide uh, doubles of different objects. And I'm going to use the method will return on that double to say, when someone asks you your name, here's what your name's going to be. This is called studying. There's going to be a query interaction, and we're going to set a kind of canned response. It's not really. Get that away for a second. So I'm going to write an example of greeting someone called Bob. Function. It can greet by name. By the way, your examples will have to start with it. That's how we pick up it's an example as opposed to you know, another method. So I sometimes start with the outcome. When I greet, uh, should return. Let's not make it, oh, should I make it Bob? Yeah, I'll make it Bob because that's what the slide said. So I sometimes start at the end. It's going to say hello, Bob, this time. Um, who's Bob? Bob's going to be a person. So I'm going to, this is a bit of magic. I'm going to say, I want a person. <laughs> Pound sign. <laughs> Wrong keyboard. Brexit means Brexit, right? Um, <clears throat> Got a person, and that person, uh, when you call get name, it will return Bob. So I'm, so, I'm trying to sort of, I've obviously done this example before, but I'm trying to illustrate the thought process. So I'm thinking, okay, there's someone whose get name is going to return Bob. When I greet, How's, it, how's the greeter going to know about the person? I guess I'm going to pass it as a parameter. These are the kind of design thinking that I'm doing just when I'm writing the example. Person doesn't exist yet. But I've just thought about the interaction. If, you, if you've got a person whose name is Bob and you greet that person, it should return, hello, Bob. Sounds reasonable. Show it to whoever I'm pairing with. They agree. Cool. Let's uh, run the test. <clears throat> so, I mean, if, you, if you're... Screen at the screen, obviously that won't pass, correct? That's the point. In TTD, you make a failing test. So I'm going to run it. First two examples worked still. It's broken. There's no such thing as a person. 
and PHP spec gets opinionated. It says, do you want me to make an interface called person? That's opinionated. It's not offering a class. It's saying, if you're going to interact, maybe your first point of call would be to make an interface. And that makes me think about it. Do I want to make an interface called person? I don't. I don't right now. I'm going to stop and think about it. <clears throat> Uncle Bob Martin says, well, it's not just him. He defined, he, he defined the uh, interface segregation principle. No client should be forced to depend on methods it doesn't use. So I'm thinking about the system. In this case, the greeter is my client. Do I want my greeter to have to depend on person? Right now, person doesn't exist, but I'm going to think a little bit about how the system is going to evolve over time. Probably I'm going to use person for other stuff as well. And the greeter might, isn't going to care about most of the other stuff. The greeter has quite a narrow, um, <clears throat> quite a narrow use case. So, on the left is the example of you know the greeter depending on the person, and then after a while, person's going to have a bunch of other methods, and greeter's still only going to care about get name. It's not going to care about all that other stuff. So. On the right, you can see the case where maybe I'm going to define an interface here. If I can define an interface called named that just says it's going to have a get name, person can implement that interface, and then when person grows later, that's fine. My greeter still just depends on the simple interface. And that means I'm going to be able to reuse greeter to greet things that aren't people, other things that have names. I can greet a group, I can greet a pet, um, you know, I can greet a robot. So that little prompt has made me think about this and it's made me change my design. <coughs> so I'm going to go back, I'm going to change this to named, I'm going to remember the keystrokes, yeah, I change it in, in example. Don't know how to say yes, I've finished renaming. <laughs> um, let's go run the test again. This time it says, hey, do you want me to make an interface called named? And I'll say yes. And it says, hey, it looks like you're trying to describe something to do with get name, but named doesn't have that. Do you want me to add a method signature to the interface? Yes, please. And then we get the red, which is what we're really after. Um, you know, you said it would say hello, Bob, and it doesn't. <clears throat> Let's see what got what happened. Um, now an interface called named. And I've defined that by describing the greeter. This is a really good way to make interfaces. You describe how another class is going to use the interface. And the, and the interface is created. So we've got a failure, and now I finally get to use my brain and write some code. The point is, everything I've done so far, if I'd had to type it out myself, I'd have been just typing out boilerplate. Here's where I use my developer brain. <coughs> so there's a failing case where we greet Bob, and uh, we don't say hello to Bob. So So let's see, when you pass the named thing, I'm just going to save this. When you're doing TDD, you save it, load. So you just get in the habit of running the tests. I broke it. Oh, because the previous examples, I didn't pass an argument. So I run the tests again. OK, I'm back to one failing test. So. Uh, Importantly, when you've got a failing test, you just want to pass quickly. So if named return hello, named get name, and it passes. Cool. So I've got working code. <coughs> and you get kind of addicted to seeing that green line. It feels really good. Um, 
I don't like it when it's red. I want to spend as little time as possible. I know this is an optimal code right now. Now it's green, I'm going to optimize this code. So what can I do? Um, so there's a duplication here, right, between these two. So what if, what if I do, mm, I'll use some of the tools uh, just to keep Gary happy. <laughs> uh, that's a name, isn't it? And if I move that, if I say the name's empty most of the time, I'm just going to run the test. Just check even that little change didn't break anything. Okay. And then I want to make these two returns look the same. That's a good technique, good refactoring technique. Make things that look a bit similar look the same. Ah, uh, it failed because there's an extra space. So if I make that. Yeah, if I put the space in here, I could noodle around on this all day. I love refactoring. That passes again. Can you see that? So. One, now, now I've got two clauses that look the same. I feel like I can take this one out. Right, and now it looks like there's something simpler I can do here. So that's that if statement is the same as named. This bit can go here. Now. I'm using an ID with an undo buffer. So because it passed five seconds ago, I'm really confident just chopping stuff out. If this fails, like you might be screaming at the screen, now you've got that the wrong way around. If that fails, I'm just gonna hit undo and it'll be passing again. And I'll try something else. Cool. That's why it's important to do refactoring when you've got passing tests. So you can say, I think, oh, I think I can just make this change and you can try it. And you can validate, yes, that does work. Um, is that nicer if I inline it? Let's try. I don't think that's valid. I think the refactoring engine might have been overconfident. Yeah. So if I'm getting nervous, I can just hit undo. Right. Uh, but I think I know what the problem is. It's grace is here. Proper languages, you can refactor better. <laughs> PHP is so nice. Um, and there's pro I can probably keep going and get that down, but um, I will not because the time is pressing. The point is, I, when it's green, I can refactor until I'm happy with the design. I'm happy it's good enough now. So we're in a situation where we have an interface for named people, but we don't have people. So let's go through the whole cycle again but um, for a concrete object. So I start with a person. I run the tests. It says, there's no such thing as a person. Do you want me to create a person? Yes. I get back to a green state. I'm not going to describe the person. Um, We have this default um, spec in there, but honestly, uh, most of the time, once you've got a few examples, you don't need this thing about it being initializable. It's just to get you going. <coughs> so in the person, I said it was going to be a named, but I got a person instead. So easy to fix. Someone is working on making this uh, automatic. I know one person who promised me they'd build this feature. So there you go. It's actually more complicated than you think. Uh, so I'll let PHP Storm solve the problem.
Ah, this is a namespace issue. The specs are in their own namespace, whereas the object is in the global namespace. This happens less when you're actually using your own namespaces. It's, a, it's easier to spot that you haven't put a use statement in yet. Okay, so that passes. And in retrospect, PHP Storm was telling me about that. So person's named, what's, what's the behavior of a person? Um, it has the name it was created with. So I'm going to say this uh, get name. Did you notice that auto completed? It's because PHP Storm knows this relationship. It knows get name is actually defined on person. <clears throat> this get name will return, let's say it's Gary. And then I've got to think, well, hang on, what's, the, what's going to cause it to be Gary? It's the name it's created with. So this is how you describe a constructor. Constructed with Gary, uh, and the real name, get name was going to return Gary. To get into this habit, running the specs. You can set up a um, watch task for this. Uh, that will constantly run every time you change a file. Um, <clears throat> that won't do these this prompting. So for the demo, I'm just running it explicitly in the terminal. It's spotted I'm using a constructor. Do I want to make a constructor? Yes, please. There. And then everything breaks. So I've made an error here, which, look, the ID is telling me, like, I'm really bad at listening. Should return. <clears throat> Should return is for matches. Will, ret will return is for stops. What's the other error? The other error is I have a case here Let's go into why this has failed. PHP spec has generated a constructor for me. And in my previous example, I didn't describe how the object's created, so I'm just gonna get it working. And now I've got the logic error we expected. I expected Gary, but got null. Let's make that work. Um, so it's constructed with a name. You can probably get, get all fancy. Um, and what do I want to do? I want to remember that name. From the constructor, and then when someone asks for the name, I'm going to return it. Let's get super fancy. Yeah. Okay. So that, that was a bit of boilerplate, but it is some logic. It's just a getter, but let's refactor. I can't. This is probably the point I should have put the type ins in. I can't see anything to change there. The repetition of be constructed with annoys me. So we have a special method uh, and then I can tidy this up. So let's get to run before all of the examples. And, uh, meant to read nicely. Let this be constructed with Gary. It should have the it should implement this interface and it should return the, the name it's created with. <coughs> Screen, I've finished refactoring, I'll think about some more behavior. Maybe um, it can be renamed. Give it a better name. 
should return uh, urine. Now I get to de design what I'm writing to spec. I get to do what's what's going to happen. I'm going to call rename. Rename two here and try to think of an expressive thing. Don't just write set name. There's a there's a word for when you change a name in English. It's we don't. I set my name by deep deep pole. So try and match the domain. Look, it's screaming out. Rename two doesn't exist. <clears throat> we'll create rename two. And then we get a logic error because the logic hasn't been written. Pop back into the person. Rename to uh, yeah, pretty pretty simple logic still. I think that's right. Now I know it's right. And get a lot of confidence from having tests and uh, getting a green state every few minutes. So the last thing, there's another kind of interaction between objects it's called a command. This is when one object tells another object to do something. So an example is whenever we greet someone, we have to log that interaction. <clears throat> we do this using a mock or a spy, and the keywords there are should be called or should have been called. And this is interaction to the query. The query we let's kind of quick look at the query. In the query, we kind of set up how and how the other object's going to be behaved, and then we test something. When we're testing a command, we want it to fail if the command uh, fails. So function it logs greetings. I'm going to uh, invent something called a logger. Uh, I'm going to say this greet, and then I'm going to say what's the thing I'm testing? Logger log hello should have been called. So when I greet someone, the logger should have been told about it. Let's. There's no such thing as a logger, okay. The logger interface doesn't have a method log, okay. Ah, nobody called log, that makes sense. So how does this object even know about the logger? I'm gonna add a let method like I did previously. constructed with the logger. So now at least the two objects know about each other. <clears throat> so they all fail because there's no constructor, but it offers to create a constructor. And now uh, we're back to the same logic error, but I feel like we've moved forward a little bit. And I'm now being given a logger. If everyone knows how to um, change that initialize field so it deletes the body of the method, then hit me up. Um, so this feels like it's closer to working. I'm just going to instinctively keep running the tests because I'm in that mode. Okay. So what I want to happen is uh, I want this thing. Ah, no, don't do that. I want that thing in a variable, don't I? Called message. And then here, I want to log it. And I'm, I'm already getting anxious that the tests haven't passed recently. So when it gets to about two minutes, something in my head's going to time out and I'm going to hit undo until they're passing again. <laughs> I don't let myself 
be in this state for too long. Okay, back to green, everything works. So what have we built? We built a greeter that talks to a named interface. We also implemented the person. We also defined an interface for a logger. And this isn't an interface I'm going to immediately implement. I'm going to choose a logging package uh, from the internet, probably monolog. And I'm going to write an adapter uh, so I can talk to that infrastructure. So this is one way of representing our domain model. You can also um, print out all the things you've defined. This is basically the tests, the, the specification that we created. So that's PHP spec. It's mostly about being descriptive. Being descriptive. I skimmed over um, some of the things. Just wanted to give you the feeling of what it's like to work with this tool. A lot of the common activities are easier or, or automated. Um, it's designed each stage by writing a specification. Current version, we just added some new matches for warnings. We added some new matches for iteration. We're working towards the version four release, which isn't going to be that different from version three. We're doing a kind of Semver style model where the last minor of, of the previous major version is uh, to the to the next major release, but we take some deprecated stuff out. Um, please come and have, contribute to the project. Um, that one step where I had to go and make the class implement the interface, we want to automate that and someone's working on it. I mentioned that if you have a complicated autoloader, you have to replicate that in PHP specs. Config, we want to fix that. And even now in PHP um, 7, there are some fatal errors you can't so we're working on a strategy so the testing tool can keep going in some of those cases. So that's it for me. Um, I'm Kieran McNulty. I haven't mentioned my employer in the Beaker, but um, we're quite cool. I look after PHP Spec and I co-organize BDD London, which is a meetup in uh, London about BDD. It's not PHP specific. Uh, come along to that. And I think we either have time for questions or we have time for Gary to wrap up. Yeah, thanks, Kieran. That was amazing. Um, uh, yeah, thankfully the, the questions have been answered um, as we went along, so there's no need for that. I will quickly, um, I will quickly like to show uh, some of the PHP Storm specific integrations because there was a couple of questions for that for three or four minutes. But before I do that, I really genuinely want to thank you. That was a, a absolutely amazing for me personally. So I'm sure everybody else feels the same way that um, I learned tons there. <laughs> so thank you, Kieran. Um, but yes, I'm going to share my own screen now, so bear with me a second. I'll tell you something, Gary. Whenever I do that presentation live, half the questions are, what was that keystroke you did in PHP Storm? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that, right? You're, you're absolutely right. So hopefully now you can see my screen. So just to quickly recap, 2016.3, um, which was our latest release um, late last year, was the, latest, the, the first release with any PHP spec support. So um, I've got a terrible example here, um, much worse than what Kieran has, but um, you can see that, uh, yeah, we can, we, we have PHP spec support in as much as once I've called my method, we get type completion on the, the matches, which is really, cool. so none of this existed before the last version. Um, and this really does help me out because I've tried to start using um, PHP spec more and more recently. Uh, we can command click through, so we'll get code completion on the method if it exists, and we can use our navigation tools to navigate between the spec and the actual uh, concrete implementation that we're testing. Um, kind of more useful for me, as Kieran mentioned, you do get in the habit of running these uh, tests all the time, and we do support the test runner, which is kind of neat it's not a perfect implementation yet but if you look here in our configuration all i've done is tell um is i've added a new php spec configuration here and i've configured it to tell it the direct oh, excuse me i've configured it to tell it the directory that my specs live in which is just the spec um directory and now i can use the the test runner to run the spec so you can see this is red this isn't massively useful because a lot of the times when you run the specs, you will want it in interactive mode because you know your failing specs will mean you need to create classes or you need to create methods. So you don't get the interaction, 
But when you're running, uh, you're in refactoring phase and you just want to run the tests, as Kieran said, for reassurance, then being able to use Control R on Mac, Shift F10 on Windows or Linux to be able to quickly run your tests at that point where you've refactored um, is kind of really useful to be able to just really run those things really quickly. As I say, you don't get any interaction from the test runner, but it has its place. Again, I would love to thank you, Ren. That was amazing. Um, if you're interested in more information about PHP Storm, if you're not using it, then just go to jetbrains.com slash PHP Storm and you'll get the, the trial available right there. Um, we love to have your feedback constantly. So um, we really do like to have your feedback on not only these webinars, but on the product and things you like and things you don't like. So please um, follow and, and tweet at us on Twitter. I'm at GWHGH and at PHP Storm. The recording will be available. Um, we do turn them around fairly quickly, so keep your eyes open for that on youtube.com slash JetBrainsTV. And the blog is also another really good point of contact to, to keep up to date on what's going on, uh, blog.jetbrains.com slash phpstorm. So thank you very much for joining us. Hopefully we'll have another webinar um, very soon. Thank you once again to Kieran. I really personally really enjoyed that. And um, thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.